Hey everybody, I guess we're gonna get started. I can get your attention real quick. Um, thanks a bunch for being here. Um, we uh, have a great guest with us tonight, but we're gonna do a few announcements before we get things rolling with um, the main event. So um, I think maybe before I get too far along or before we get kind of wrapped up in uh, why we're all here, we should uh, make sure that we uh, thank the person that did really did all the heavy lifting to make tonight happen. And that's TC Owens. So if we can. Yep. So, um, so I got a couple of announcements I'm going to make really quick before I turn it over to Kirk Klingensmith from uh, FFI. So um, first of all, Trout Unlimited wants to thank everyone here who uh, came and contributed to um, the, uh, the um, Ithaca Fishing Day in March. Uh, we made, I think, something like $2,000 to put toward the Trout in the Classroom program. So thank you all. Yeah, great. And everybody who came to the um, uh, Iron Fly last month, that's an event that we just started doing recently, something a little different. So hopefully you all had a good time if you made it to that. We'll definitely try to do it again next year. Um, in addition, if we think about some upcoming things, there's going to be a cleanup on the Tafnioga River uh, on June, on Saturday. Okay, so Saturday the 13th, there will be a cleanup on the Tafnioga River starting at nine o'clock. You can meet at the McDonald's parking lot that's on Riverside Drive, which is off of exit 11, off of 80, which is off exit 11, off 81. I believe the physical address for that McDonald's is Clinton Avenue. So you can meet there a little bit before nine. Everything will be provided. Tayo is a great fishing stream. It also gets a lot of trash. So if you got some time this Saturday, it'd be great if you can come and help that help out and clean that up. Also, we're going to do the, um, the film tour again this year. The um, International Fly Fishing Film Festival is coming to Ithaca again on Saturday, September 30th. We put some um, quarter cards out on the tables that have QR codes. Feel free to scan those and you can save the information. And we'll be putting a ton of information out on Instagram and Facebook. So no need to go any further. Saturday, September 30th, IF4 at the Hopshire Brewery up on 13. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kirk. Thanks, Ben. Hey, glad to have you all here. It's good to see you. Um, by the way, we have when I left there, we had 13 people who were joining us uh, virtually. So it's not just here. We're on the, the web as well. Um, so a couple announcements uh, on behalf of uh, Twin Tiers Five Rivers. You think this will work? Of course it won't. Can you just? No, it doesn't. There we go. All right. So we're going to do a, a rod raffle at the end of the evening. Uh, there, we've been selling um, tickets for since January. Uh, but the drawing is tonight. The winner gets their choice of any rod that TFO makes for the first time ever. We're going to include the spay rod this year. Vince is going to do the drawing. If you're online and you want to use that QR code, or if you're here and you want to use the QR code and pay through PayPal, you can do that. You just need to have it done before 7:30. Which uh, so Vince is gonna so Vince captures your okay um good give me a click um so uh, our club uh, we're doing a casting night it's the second Monday in June um uh, and it is very popular. Uh, we're going to be doing that at Kinsilla Park in, in Painted Pulse. You can come uh, practice your casting, learn with some instructors, certified instructors, 
And for the first time ever, we're going to have a spay caster there to work uh, with you if you want to get the two-handed rod thing going. So that's June 12th. All right. So uh, if you're not familiar with our club, there's uh, two ways to really connect with us. Uh, first is subs subscribe to our emails. We send email out to over 400 people. We have 80 members. Uh, but we welcome folks to join us for events, fishing trips, and the likes. If you're not subscribed to the email, go ahead and do that. There's the code to do it. You will subscribe on the web page. We uh, post up on Facebook almost all our events, um, and that is also a good place to connect with us. So those two ways, email or Facebook, are our primary ways to talk to uh, our members in the fly fishing community. All right, I want to say then uh, lastly that we're making a recording of this program uh, and uh, Jake has agreed. We'll be posting that up on our YouTube channel. So if there, you don't have to take copious notes, uh, you can go back and look at it later, just relax. Uh, this also gives an opportunity for some of our members who couldn't be here tonight. I've had several emails um, that they'll be able to uh, to join us later. So uh, now it's my job to introduce TC. All right, folks, thanks once again for being here. Uh, I'll be brief. But uh, I want to introduce really quick uh, Jake Vilwak. Um, Jake's an industry professional that's been uh, guiding and working in the fishing industry for over 14 years and uh, grew up in a uh, commercial fishing family from the on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, he's been a uh, he's worked as a deckhand and fly fishing guide in Alaska and um, since uh, beginning in 2009, worked for TCO Fly Shop in Reading, Pennsylvania, and their Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania locations. Um, he's helped open and manage their newest location in Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania. And after eight years as a full-time retail manager, uh, Jake has started his own uh, business, Relentless Fly fishing um which uh you know does contract guide services for uh, uh tco fly shop locations so jake's a guide for uh trout and smallmouth and steelhead um, but really his true passion is for smallmouth and other warm water species um in addition to uh being a guide uh jake is also the author of smallmouth bass flies top to bottom which he has copies of here which he'll sign um i encourage you to pick up a copy before heading out um and um he's also uh, a contributing author to fly fisher magazine eastern fly fishing magazine montana fly and then uh he's a blog writer and i mean he's really i mean there, there's a bunch of stuff on this bio he he's a he, he's a young guy and an, an emerging voice in the in the field. I saw we we got to see him at Edison give a couple couple talks in January, and he's just out of sight. And the presentation tonight is one that he hasn't done before. So give a warm welcome to Jake Vilwalk. Don't drink my beer. All right, we're gonna make sure that this works before I go any further. Oh, it did. Okay, cool, huh? I just have a magic touch. I don't know anything about technology. Anyway, I appreciate you guys having me up here. Um, so we're gonna talk about smallmouth bass. Um, my presentation is called Advanced Tactics. Um, kind of go over a lot of the different food sources. Uh, we're gonna go over some of the different presentations, some flies. Um, I used to have a whole probably third of this presentation on the different seasons and stuff like that. Uh, but I realized that I got super nerded out on some of the more presentation stuff, and the newer stuff that I got actually kicked off 
of the stage at Edison because I was talking too much. So I had to change it a little bit and I wanted to get a little bit more in depth on that. So we're going to talk about really quick the seasons of smallmouth. Um, Pennsylvania and really anywhere if you're willing to does have a 12-month smallmouth season. Um, spring is kind of a special time of year when those bigger fish are coming out of big water and going into smaller creeks. Um, you know, so we're fishing that kind of migration of those pre-spawn and post-spawn fish. Um, it's one of my favorite times to fish, but summertime is also a great time to fish. It's a different experience. Um, you know, you're in the spring, you're fishing bigger fish. In the summertime, you're spending more time tech doing like kind of more technical dry fly fishing for bass. And I get really excited about that. A lot of sight fishing and things like that. So summer, spring, summer, fall. Um, one thing that's very interesting about the, uh, the spring that I'm going to go back now um, for the fall is that not only are these smallmouth coming in to spawn, but they're also coming into like a perfectly balanced ecosystem for predator to prey. And so you have those residential bass and those residential bait, the bait and the forage food. It's all kind of pretty balanced out. And then you release these tour buses of giant females and, and males coming in from these big rivers. And now there's this huge competition to feed. So they become much more aggressive, not only because of the spawning run, but because there's not as much food in the system to support the amount of fish that are in there. Um, that's the same type of thing that starts to happen in the fall. These fish are coming out of the winter time in the spring and the zombie-like stage, they're super aggressive. And then once you hit the fall, all of that normal food, the, the, the bugs, the crayfish, all of their, probably 80% of their diet is now disappeared and all that's left is bait fish. So there's this competition to feed on these bait fish. They're also starting to school up a little bit because when they go into the winter months, they kind of winter in similar sizes because an eight inch smallmouth by about February is gonna look really tasty to a 20 inch smallmouth. So they kind of know that and they stay away from each other. Um, so there's that competition to feed, but they also know that with those, those days that are getting shorter and the nights that are, um, and the day temps are getting colder, those fish know that they're about to go back into that zombie-like stage. So they're going to eat as much as possible. So spring and fall are actually the two uh, most aggressive times of year to fish for smallmouth. That's why you can get away with fishing bigger flies a little bit more aggressively. And then what, what did you do to my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> well, while he's doing that, um, winter time is another kind of fun time to get out and fish for bass if you want to go out and catch one or two fish uh, a day. Um, but winter time is also kind of the show season for us. And so I do all these talks on smallmouth. And by about February, I'm like, I want to go smallmouth fishing. So we go out um, and we figured out ways to catch fish in the winter time, but it's not the most glamorous ways to catch fish. But um, anyway, can I hit the button now? Yeah. Now, ah, what'd you do? Winter time. Uh, another really cool thing about winter fish, and I love this picture because you can see how yellow that fish is and how pale that fish is. Smallmouth bass, when they get those bars on their sides and they get super colored up, that's actually the same thing as us getting a suntan. That is their body absorbing vitamin D. When you're in the winter time, their metabolism is almost non existent and they're pretty deep in the rivers and lakes. And so they don't get a lot of sunlight. So when you catch these fish, they're almost translucent, which is kind of interesting. And you'll also see that sometimes in the springtime as well. And you can kind of tell if you fish systems that have resident bass that also get the migratory fish to come in, you can almost tell the difference between the two, especially early season, because you got those darker kind of normal colored smallmouth. And then you have these super yellow, light olive color fish. And you can almost guarantee that those, those lighter color fish are actually going to be um, migratory fish. So um, did you break it? Yeah. All right. So I, we're going to go into food now, but I want to, I want to tell you guys three very important things. Now, I don't think they can see it on zoom, but I'm going to show you these three very important things about smallmouth are going to directly correlate with a lot of the food that they eat. So they have amazing eyesight. Smallmouth's primary, primary hunting sense is eyesight. They will hunt with lateral lines. They will hunt with smell, but they would prefer to use their eyeballs. They have basically 4K vision before 4K was actually a thing on a TV, um, which is why when they come up and stare at your popper and don't eat it, it's kind of frustrating. But 
They're genetically designed for a slow creep and a very short explosive movement. That is why when they crawl or when they swim along the bottom and there's a crayfish right here, they're going to come up and get as close as they possibly can before that crayfish or other forage food realizes they're in trouble. And they're going to close the gap extremely quickly, but it's a very short distance, which is why when you fish crayfish flies, it is pretty much the most impossible thing to do to catch a smallmouth when it comes to being able to feel those, feel those fish eat. When you're fishing a bait fish, those fast come up and they, they eat it really aggressively. They swim through it. A lot of times you're fishing white flies. You can see it a lot of times. Um, so you can kind of tell when that fish eats it. Well, when you're, when you're fishing a crayfish and you're slow crawling that along the bottom, that bass is going to come up and grab it. And if you don't have perfect connection with that fly, that fish is going to spit it and chew it around, see if it tastes right, and then spit it out before you realize it's even on there. So they, it's an aggressive eat, but it's in a very short distance. Um, and that's why fishing a crayfish is super fun, but also very frustrating. Um, again, explosive speed. We'll go to that one. The reason why I want to say that is because when we get into food and flies, I want you to all pay attention to the pictures of the actual food that I'm showing you. I took every single one of these photos, either with an iPhone or a waterproof camera, no macro lenses or anything like that. So if I can get that close to this crayfish to take a picture, how close can an 18 inch smallmouth get to those things before they realize they're in trouble? That is why I start by saying the genetic design to close that gap very quickly because a significant amount of their forage food has the same characteristic of wait, wait, wait. Oh man, I'm in trouble. I'm out. And by the time they're say I'm out, they're already in the small mouse mouth. So it is one of their main food sources. They've done, um, do, uh, what am I trying to say here? Um, they've done uh, studies on their actual diet. Diet, that was what I was looking for. Uh, dietary studies on smallmouth. And in August and September, 80% of a smallmouth diet is actually crayfish. And what's interesting about that is August and September is about the time that all of those bugs that float on the surface start to disappear. There's no more grasshoppers. There's no more cicadas. There's no more mayflies. The damselflies are all gone. Crayfish and minnows are about the only thing that's left. But what's also interesting is that about that time of year is when the young of the year crayfish come out and there's 8 billion one inch crayfish around. So it is a very easy food source for those fish to eat. Typically, a small mouse diet is about 50% crayfish. And then in the, those two main months of August, September, it's about 80%, which is pretty interesting. Um, all different sizes, you know, we get the rusty invasive crayfish, which can be up to about five inches. And then of course you have the baby ones that are under one inch. So, you know, you have a very wide range of different sizes they can use. Lots of different colors. One thing that I find very interesting about like winter time is you get a lot of blue and purple crayfish. When they molt, they change colors a lot and they get that bluish color and that, paint, that purple color. But typically olive brown, orange and tan are your main colors. One thing that's very important to look at that I forget a lot of times is you notice in the in between the claws, the junction of the claws, there's orange in there. And most crayfish also have orange on their tips of their claws. Sometimes we'll have it in the joints of their legs. Orange is, in my opinion, a trigger color for smallmouth bass. It is a confidence color. They're like a lot of the food that I eat on a regular basis has orange in it. So a lot of the flies that I that I tie when I'm fishing subsurface and on the bottom are going to have some sort of orange hotspot. Orange to smallmouth is chartreuse to a saltwater fish. It's that one color that always triggers those fish to eat. What did you do? I don't know if you're... So these are just a couple of different patterns that I use uh, a lot. So on the very bottom, you've got the fly fish food, El Crossito. The middle one is Chuck Craft Clawdad. And the top one is a Pat Cohen Jiggy Crawl. That is more of my wintertime crayfish. Lots of movement, lots of rubber legs. If you threw that in the middle of summertime, you'd see every smallmouth within a mile run away. You go to the smaller, more natural colored stuff in the, in the summertime. Um, I don't fish a lot of heavy, heavy crayfish, and we'll talk about that when we get into the techniques, but there's just a couple examples of what we have. And then there's a fish with a crayfish sticking out of its mouth. Sculpins. So again, same thing with my cell phone. Don't tell my fiance I stick my iPhone in the water. She'll get very mad. Um, they're not very often found in a lot of our actual warm water fisheries. Susquehanna and Junietta, for exa example, both of them, at least where I am, hit 90, 92 degrees in the summertime. Sculpins are a cold water uh, minnow. So they will not be found regularly in some of these bigger systems. 
but in all of the creeks that these bass run up into in the springtime, they are loaded with sculpins. Also around the mouths of those creeks, there's lots of sculpins. So it is something they eat on a regular basis, but you're not gonna find them a lot in the big rivers. What's very interesting with that fact is that for the last 10 years of my career, sculpins have been one of my number one producing flies in the middle of summertime in these rivers that don't have sculpins. And I'm gonna show you why in two slides, but, just a couple of different patterns here. The bottom one is um, one of my flies. It's called the freeze-dried sculpin. Middle one is the over easy sculpin. And the top one is um, the smoke and mirror sculpin. That is actually more of a Western trout fly, but also a killer smallmouth fly. But you'll notice that every single one of them has a little bit of orange in it. So even though they're sculpins and not crayfish, they still have orange accent because I think it's important. That is a sculpin in a fish's mouth. Catfish. So. One of my best friends is a biologist for, this, for Pennsylvania, and we had this conversation about sculpins about three years ago, and I was like, wait a minute, but they eat sculpins really well. He's like, I'm not really sure. And then I started looking at other food when I was writing a book, and I was like, catfish. Catfish, stone cats, mad toms, baby channel cat, baby flatheads, they all have the same exact profile as a sculpin. So I think, I can't talk to smallmouth, but I think, that for the last 10 years, almost every single smallmouth I've caught on a sculpin fly has actually been eating it as a catfish imitation because there are millions of catfish, baby catfish, mad toms and stone cats everywhere. If you talk to a bait fisherman, a mad tom or a stone cat is like crack cocaine to smallmouth bats. It is their favorite uh, fish to actually use as bait for smallmouth. So this is the over easy sculpin. And just to show you, I get one of my number one producing sculpin patterns. It looks a lot like the top part of a of a or profile of a catfish. If you really wanted to make a true catfish, you can put some rubber legs on the front of it. And now you got a mad top. That's a fish. By the way, every single one of these fish that I've had flies pictures of, with, uh, with, I caught on live minnows and then put flies in their mouth to take the pictures. I'm just kidding. So darters, uh, these are often mistaken as sculpins. Um, this particular picture is a common channel darter, but there are over 20 different species of darters in the state of Pennsylvania. And if you've ever seen a darter in spawning colors, it looks like it should be in a five-year-old kid's aquarium. It, they are super bright colors. They're chartreuses, they're pinks, they're greens. Um, they're really cool looking, but they're an easy meal for a smallmouth to get. They have that same weight, 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 and then I'm going to run characteristic. Again, that was taken with my iPhone. So Getting that close to it, realizing that it's not in trouble and it can sit there for a long time is important. A couple of different patterns. So the Clouser minnow obviously is one of the best flies for smallmouth and really anything that swims. Um, what's really cool about that fly is that just by changing the color of the actual bucktail, you can make it look like any minnow possible. So when it comes to darters, I have a lot of darter colored ones. Um, and then you've got the middle one. That's uh, just kind of a darter a lot of different things. I use it as a as a leech a lot of times, but it's just a bottom dwelling, you know, lots of movement in there. And then the Zuddler minnow. Zuddler minnow is a combination between a zonker and a mother minnow. One of my favorite smallmouth flies. Never really understood why they ate it until I finally got a darter and I was like, oh, it's the exact same profile as a darter. So um, it also looks like a lot of different minnows too. So that's just another smallmouth. So bait fish. Use that as an umbrella. Um, and then underneath of that, you've got minnows, shiners, dace, and chubs. Those are kind of the four subspecies or subcategories. One very interesting thing about minnows is that carp are actually in the minnow family, which is cool. They're the largest minnow in the United States. Um, but there are 39 different species of native minnows in the state of Pennsylvania. Shiners, dace, creek chubs, those are kind of your common ones. And then you've got many different species underneath of that. Uh, the top one up here is a blunt nose Allegheny Shiner, um, and the bottom one is the black nose Dace. They've got that very, very distinct line on them. Um, very, all of the minnows are typically schooling, schooling minnows, so they're easy meals. What's very interesting about minnows and smallmouth is that minnows are also cold-blooded, so they have the same migratory daily pattern as a smallmouth bass, which means they are always in front of smallmouth bass. They typically will start to move a little sooner than the bass do because they're smaller, so they need to get warmer quicker. Um, so when the bass move up out of the deeper water in the shallows, there's an all-you-can-eat buffet, which is why bass like to eat minnows because they're always around. 
This is a picture. So I got two different slides of, of flies on this one. This is kind of more of my springtime stuff. We're in that like four to five inch minnow range. So you've got Mike Schultz's Swing and D, Blaine Chocolate's Feather Changer. Um, that's a fly that we've kind of come up with called the Variant. And then the top one is one of mine called the Roamer. Um, so all of those are going to be in that kind of four to five inch range. That's when we're fishing, you know, those more aggressive fish. But as we move into the summertime, we get much smaller. Even if the smallmouth bass is eating a four or five inch minnow in the summertime, when the water is low and clear, it is impossible as an angler to get a four or five inch minnow in the water to present to that fish without spooking it because it causes so much commotion in low clear water. I have never seen a bass stick its nose up to a perfectly presented small minnow, even though it just ate a five inch minnow 10 minutes before that. So same similar flies you got the clouds of minnow this the middle one is my roamer in the two to three inch range and then you've got the micro finesse changer um again very lightweight the clouds are obviously has lead eyes on it but the other two are virtually weightless so they hit the water uh really softly the clouds are typically going to use when we're in faster water we need to get down a little bit quicker so you don't have to worry about that sound print when that fly is hitting the water necessarily but I try to keep it as strategically quiet as possible in the summertime. And that's another fish with a fly in its face. Bank dwelling food, frogs and mice. Size and color vary. There are plenty of different species of frogs. You got spring peepers, you got gray tree frogs, you got bullfrogs, you got green frogs, um, all different types of frogs. What's very interesting about frogs is that frogs and toads actually mate at the same time that smallmouth move into these creeks to migrate. So you don't really think about springtime topwater fishing, but right about now when that water starts to hit that mid 50s to low 60s, those bass have enough you know, metabolism moving that they are willing to go to the surface and eat those frogs. But there are plenty of frogs around. It is an actual match the hatch food source in the springtime. And then mice, not great swimmers, they don't make it across the larger bodies of water very easily. If you've ever seen the, the trout movie Blue Moon when they're fishing mice in, in New Zealand, just like that, they don't make it. They're dead. They're easy, but they create a lot of commotion. I have never personally seen a mouse swim across any of the rivers that I fish, but smallmouth go absolutely nuts over those things. And after I show you these couple of different patterns that we use, I'm going to show you why I love mouse fishing for smallmouth bass. So just a lot of different deer hair and foam in there. This is why I love mouse fishing for smallmouth bass. That is a six inch smallmouth with a three inch mouse in its mouth. You do catch big smallmouth on them as well, but for whatever reason, if you throw a mouse in a smallmouth area, they will absolutely destroy it. And I think it's one because they're not totally sure what it is or they actually know exactly what it is and they don't see them very often. So they've got to eat them. But I've never seen a more aggressive eat than catching a bass on a mouse. And then of course, who doesn't love catching giant smallmouth on deer hair frogs? So. Um, I will say, going backwards to that spring thing, I was out exploring a new float yesterday with one of my other guides, and we, we got into the river and we saw two fish that could have been trout, fall fish, rise, and he looks at me and goes, you know, mere mortals would be fishing bay fish right now, but what are you going to do? I said, I guess I'm going to fish a frog. So we fished frogs all day yesterday and had activity the entire time. It was super fun. So early May, they're already eating frogs, which is super awesome. So Helgramites, these are the grossest, nastiest, most disgusting things on the planet. They hurt when they bite. They're nasty. I still get the little five-year-old when I see one. Um, but smallmouth love them. Genetically, they will eat them anywhere. I, when I first started guiding for bass, I was guiding on a Schuylkill River. Uh, that runs through Redding out into Philadelphia and dumps into the Delaware. And for about six years, I looked under every single rock, tried to find a Helgramite or the adult version of the Dobson fly, and I never found one. Either I really suck at finding them or there's just not that many in that system. And the Helgramite fly was my number one fly on that creek. So even if there's not a good, healthy population of them, smallmouth know that it's a big nymph and they're going to eat it. Bait fishermen, I would say this is the number two when it comes to what they're going to fish is bait. It's a stone cat and then a Helgramite. Helgramites are also very uh, durable. They're very tough. Um, and you can catch six or seven smallmouth on one Helgramite before it stops moving. It is, they're, they're not, there's something wrong with these things. Um, <laughs> there was an article written in Fly Fisherman or, 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 or Fly Tire Magazine probably eight or nine years ago, and it was about tying Helgramites. And it was called the devil's reject. 
And I thought it was a very fitting name for that. So uh, three different patterns that I use. The bottom one is called the Sure Thing Helgramite, just a super buggy, you know, relatively larger Helgramite. Um, the middle one is one that I have come up with. It's also in my book. That is called the Devil's Doorstop. That one never made it into being rejected. It just holds the door open. And then the top one is um, another Chuck Craft pattern, the Critter Mite. All of them are, that's pretty much the only Helgamite patterns that I use. There are plenty of other Helgamite patterns out there, but I like buggy and I like durable. And that's a Helgamite in a small mouth. Stoneflies and nymphs. This is a, a subject that's getting a little bit more popular in the smallmouth and warm water world, but stoneflies and nymphs are a huge source of food for these for smallmouth bass, especially the smaller fish. Smaller bass act a lot like a trout when it comes to eating nymphs and things like that. I have caught bass and ripples that are literally oozing with mayfly nymphs, um, but they're big nymphs. A stonefly nymph or a hex nymph is about two to three inches long. So it's a good source of protein. And if it's a readily available food source, they're going to eat them. What's super cool about stoneflies, this picture, again, was taken um, by me and my, my iPhone. That was on the Juniata River. Stoneflies, the bigger black stonefly, that is basically our version of the salmon fly out west. They need the healthiest water to actually survive. So to see those in some of our warm water fisheries that used to be impaired just shows you how much cleaner these systems are. And so seeing that bug life is very, very important. So nymphing and fishing smaller flies for smallmouth is very important. It's also something that we have kind of taken from the trout world. One of the number one ways that I can catch fish in the summertime when it's low clear water is fishing a popper with a small stonefly or some nymph underneath of it, hopper dropper, popper dropper. So taking that, you know, from the trout world, it's just another way to get that because if those bass are being super picky and they're not, they don't want to eat a popper that's moving really fast or very loud and they're being very skittish, you put that popper on the surface and you drop a nymph about 18 inches to two feet below it and you dead drift that straight across the flat where there's some bass, they are going to come over and curiously look at that and eat it because it's something that's not creating a lot of commotion. It's confidence they're going to eat it. It's just one of those things to keep in your in your hat or your back pocket when you're having a rough day, go out and throw a popper dropper and you'd be amazed on how many fish you catch on that stuff. And of course, the nymphs that we fish are big and they're fun. So you've got a couple of different stonefly nymphs. You've got a, a, a hex nymph and a dragonfly nymph there. So we're not talking about pheasant tails necessarily. We're still talking about, you know, size eight and 10 uh, bigger nymphs. So you can also fish articulated ones. But um, and then we talk about big bucks, so the adult versions of all those. The other thing that we talk about a lot is cicadas. The annual cicada or the dog day cicada is out every single day from about mid-July until about the end of August. It definitely gets kind of shadowed by the 17-year cicada because when the 17-year cicada comes, there's, there's not, you just can't compete with that fly. There's so many of them. They eat them. They go crazy. Um, cicadas whether they're the 17 year or they're the annual cicada, when they hit the water, they're either very close to dead or they're dead. So they're gonna create a good amount of commotion if they're still alive trying to buzz. They cannot get off the water. So that is one of the reasons why fishing a popper is really is, can be very productive because a lot of those bigger bugs actually create a lot of commotion on the water, but they don't do a lot of this, bloop, 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 when they come across the water. So one thing that we've started doing in the summertime especially when it's low and clear, is actually fishing poppers without popping them. And so fishing a popper without popping it, if you, if you give any angler of any age a popper and you tell them not to pop it, it is the most impossible thing that you will ever do. So what we did was we kind of, you touched it again. You touched it again, it won't work. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so you got damselflies, dragonflies, hexes, whiteflies, and grasshoppers. And so going back to the popper comment, can you hit the button? Yeah. So we started reducing the urge to pop by removing the ability to pop by putting on grasshoppers, bigger mayflies, or very small poppers that don't pop. So we fish a lot of grasshoppers and a lot of bigger, bigger mayflies in the summertime when you can't get those when those fish will not react to a popper so going something more natural is very important the other thing that i found especially when it's low and clear when you're fishing poppers or other bugs like that is you will get a lot of those trout inspections from bass they'll come up and they'll look at it and they'll float around it you float around it it is 
so important to not move that fly until that bass does something, whether that bass goes a little bit closer to it or starts to back off of it. If you move that fly while it's inspecting it, there's a really good chance it's not going to eat it. My number one success, or I should say the most successful I've ever been when I have those situations is as soon as that bass starts to go away, you just lift the rod tip up a little bit and that fly skates just about two to three inches across, away from that thing, creates a little ripple and that bass will turn around and come up and grab it. So making sure that you're not over presenting a fly is very important in the summertime and being able to you know, watch what that fish is doing, read the rise. There's so many things in the trout world that we now see in the bass world. Reading the rise is one of those things. Paying attention to what that fish is doing in reaction to what you're doing to that fly can be very, very important. That's a fish. So gear and techniques, how do we fish? We're gonna talk a little bit about fly lines. Um, Lefty Cray wrote an article for fly fishermen probably close to 10 years ago now that he said, when he started fly fishing, there were four different fly lines on the market. Now there's over 400 different fly lines. So we have overcomplicated the fly line market to the point where it can be somewhat confusing for people. This is the number one question that I get asked via email, Instagram, or on the water. What line should I use? What line should I have? What are you using? First thing we're going to talk about is intermediate lines or sinking lines. I do not fish any fast sinking lines. If you see a type three, type five, type seven, type nine, you will never see that on my boat. I think they sink a little bit too fast. They keep you not as connected to the fly. Um, intermediate lines, they sink just a little bit, one to two inches per second. They create that really nice tight angle. On that fly, you've got your leader, your fly, and you've got this perfect angle between you and the tip of that rod and that fly. Um, so if you need to get down deeper, go to a slightly heavier fly. I do not have a lot, well, that's not true. I have a lot of fly reels, but um, I do not have a lot of different fly lines, but I have some of the same exact flies in my box and they've got three or four different weights on them. So I might have a, a bead chain, I might have a small lead eye, I might have a small tungsten bead, and then I might have a medium or a large lead eye. And so that gives me the ability to fish that same fly at different depths if I need to. Changing your fly line is not necessarily the important part when it comes to getting down because as soon as you add a fast sinking line, you lose connectivity. This picture shows you exactly what those lines are gonna look like. Intermediate line, you're gonna get that perfect angle. A sinking line, you're gonna get that giant J or that L shape in there and your fly is basically dragging on the bottom. That does two things. One, that means that a small mouth has to hold on to that fly long enough for that line to go like from this to that. And typically by that time, you feel that fish right as it spits the fly out and you go, man, I almost had him. No, you never actually had that fish. It was way ahead of you on that one. The other thing is, is that if you're, if you're fishing a heavy singing line with a heavy fly, all you're doing is driving that fly underneath of every single rock on that river. If you're fishing a lighter fly or you're fishing an intermediate line, every time you strip it, you're lifting that fly up. You're creating that kind of hop and that fall, that hop and that fall versus that kind of snow shovel dig, you now have more action in that and you're gonna spend way less time losing flies, retying flies and getting unstuck if you stick with an intermediate line versus a fast sinking line and just change the weight of your actual fly. What do you, yes. That is a great question. Um, I personally like a full intermediate, especially if I'm fish. Well, so here's, that's why it's a great question. If I'm fishing bait fish in that four to five inch range, I love a full intermediate line because there are plenty of times where if you've got a floating line with an intermediate head, that fly is not getting down deep enough. And if you switch those lines, I'll give you a quick story. The other day we were fishing and the first third of the float, we were fishing a floating line with an intermediate head and, and bait fish. And I could still see the fly pretty much the entire time. The water was a little bit murky and we didn't catch a lot of fish. And I was like, I, we're fishing over fish. I know there's fish here. So I switched lines to a full intermediate and we dropped down about four inches deeper and we started catching fish. So it kind of depends on that, that the conditions. But if you don't have the ability to have a bunch of different spools with different lines, I would just stick with a full intermediate. Um, the clear tips are really... I think the clear tips actually sink a little bit faster than say like a scientific angler Titan taper. They have an inter a full intermediate, but it's not a clear tip. So the core is different. It's a little bit more buoyant 
versus those clear tips, they have a different core. It's more of a mono core, so it's slightly heavier. And those clear tips are going to sink a little bit faster. So the short answer is I like a full intermediate. If you have the ability to have a couple of different sink rates of those intermediates, it's a good idea. Um, when it was low, clear, and almost like summertime flows the last the first three weeks of April, I was fishing a floating line with a 10-foot intermediate tip, and that was perfect. A full intermediate was actually too heavy. But typical flows, a full intermediate gets you where you need to be all the time. So. Every time that mouse gets up on there, something happens. <laughs> huh? Okay. I might be. I'm not sure. We're going to test that. Actually. All right. We'll test that theory. Um, floating lines. So there are plenty of fly lines out there now that say bass bug or smallmouth bass or just bass on them. Most of those lines are designed to throw deer hair frogs or deer hair poppers. They are typically one or two line weights heavier. They have a very aggressive front taper. If you look at that front taper, that is the scientific angler bass bug line. It is two line weights heavier. It has a giant shooting head on it. It is designed to throw those bigger flies so you can cast that fly and keep that velocity going at a pretty far distance. If you downsize your fly to a grasshopper or a smaller fly, you are going to get that same amount of velocity, but now you don't have that stop sign in the middle of the air slowing that fly down. So that fly is going to hit the water at Mach 7 and spook every single fish on in the river. So what I typically do if I'm going to fish a bass bug line or one of those heavier lines is I actually downsize one. So for instance, the smallmouth, the bass bug line from SA is a, if you buy, if you have an eight weight, you buy an eight weight line, you're actually buying a 10 weight line. So I put seven weights on all my eight weights and I put six weights on my seven weights and so on and so forth, because that gives me the ability to, to still throw those bugs pretty far, those bigger bugs far, but it also gives me the ability to present those smaller bugs a little bit easier. That is what I would say if you, again, don't have the ability to have multiple different rods. I do look like I'm going to a bass tournament sometimes. I'll throw like nine different rods on my boat and each one's got a different line on it for a different situation. But if you have the ability to have two different lines, two different floating lines, I would say have a bass bug heavy line, and then I'd have some sort of lighter line. This particular taper is a Scientific Angler MPX, the same as the Rio Grande. Um, it's one, it's a half line weight heavier. It is designed for throwing grasshoppers, indicator rigs, a little bit more weight. So you'll still get that good carry in the summertime for those, those smaller bugs, but you're not going to hit the water as hard. So you know, floating lines and intermediate lines, there are definitely some gray area on what you should have or what you can have. But if you have, if you don't have the ability, I would stick with a full intermediate line and I would get a one size lighter bass bug line or bass line um, and just kind of stick with that. But if you can and have the ability to switch those over, I run these bass bug lines pretty much from now until the middle of July. And then when that water starts to drop down and gets a little clearer, I will switch to those MPXers or those kind of lighter lines and stick with those the rest of the season. So I do switch lines out a good bit, um, but that's pretty much it. Floating line and an intermediate line. You don't need anything else. Although I just talked for like 10 minutes about lines, so I still made it overcomplicated. Um, streamers. So streamers don't always mean large. Micro streamers, small bait fish and low clear water. I mentioned that before. You know, being able to get your fly in the water to present that to the fish is more important than matching the actual size of the bait that they're eating. Presentation and getting in front of that fish is the most important part. Actively retrieving or manipulation. Streamer fishing is basically, by definition, you manipulating and actively moving that fly. It's not like a dry fly where it's just floating or a nymph that's just floating. Streamer fishing doesn't mean bait fish. It doesn't mean chucking meat. It doesn't mean sculpins. It just means taking a fly and actually moving it to make it do something. Double streamers is another big thing that we do, especially when it comes to uh, manipulating weight. Say you're just barely light, or you're barely too light to get where you wanna be in the column. Instead of changing flies, why don't you just throw one extra fly on there? And now you've just like double nymphing for trout. Now you have two different types of uh, offerings for that smallmouth. So a lot of times what I'll do if I do double streamers, and I do it mainly when I'm in faster or deeper water, is I'll run a crayfish on the top and a helgenite on the bottom or a sculpin on top and a crayfish on the bottom. You know, two of those kind of bottom dwelling bugs 
and that gives you a little bit more depth control, but it also gives you the option um, of, of, or I should say gives the fish the option of eating something other than what you were presenting. And every once in a while, you'll actually catch two smallmouth on one rig, and that's kind of fun. It's also really trippy if you like see a bass here and over here, and they're both doing the same thing, like what's happening? Um, another thing that's actually really interesting too, about right about now in the springtime, if you, if you have an articulated fly with two hooks and you catch a fish, and some of you might have already seen this, but a lot of times another bass will come up and try to take that fly out of the fish's mouth. And about once every three years, we actually hook two fish on one fly, which occasionally you get both of them in, but typically you have the big one on and then the little one eats it and knocks the big one off and you land the little one. But that's just kind of the luck of the draw. Um, so our streamer setup. I typically I'm running six weights in the summertime and eight weights in the in the in the springtime. I have never met a smallmouth bass that a six weight can't handle, but I've met plenty of smallmouth bass flies that a six weight can't handle. So mainly it comes to what the size of the fly is that I'm throwing, how far I'm throwing it, and what we're kind of looking at condition wise in that sense. So six to eight weight rods, again low summer flow, six weights. I do build my own leaders, but there are plenty of streamer leaders out there that you can buy in that four and a half to seven and a half foot range. Um, I tie all of my streamer leaders with fluorocarbon because typically when I'm streamer fishing, I'm either fishing a minnow and I'm getting close to logs or I'm running it a little bit slower down in the bottom. I'm running that leader over top of all kinds of different um, abrasion, you know, abrasive, abrasive, um, you know, structures and things like that. So fluorocarbon is going to sink a little bit. It's more dense than monofilament. It also has a higher abrasion break strength than mono does. So I'm spend a lot of time tying flies so the best advantage that i can have to keeping that fly on when a fish eats it or when i get stuck the better um, so i like fluorocarbon personally this is my basic leader for streamer fishing it's not anything super fancy i do run micro swivels on all of my bass stuff even when it comes to dry flies 40 pound micro swivels for deer hair stuff and streamers 25 pound micro swivels for more of that grasshopper and smaller stuff i have never had one of those micro swivels pull a popper or a dry fly under the surface. So no, it doesn't pull the fly under surface. That's another fish. So weighted, weighted streamers on floating line. This is something that has kind of taken most of my mental uh, bandwidth the last couple of years. And I've really geeked out on this and got excited about it. Um, I was sick and tired of tying going home after guiding and having to tie six new crayfish or six helgramites every single day. I was tired of losing all of those flies, blowing these holes out because we got stuck and we had to go get it, or we, you know, lost three or four. I mean, you never actually were fishing. You were just getting your flies unstuck. So after spending a good amount of my, my life saltwater fishing, I realized that bonefish, permit, redfish, snook, tarpon, all of those species 90% of the time you're fishing a floating line with a longer leader to get that fly down. And also, I've had a lot of conversations with some people about this. I have a couple of clients that I guide that spin fish, and they are amazing tube fishing, tube fishermen or Ned fishermen. So jigging on the bottom and this Ned rig, if you're familiar with it, if you're not, it's a stick bait about this big that is very buoyant and extremely durable. And when it hits the bottom with the jig head, it sticks straight up and down like this. And all of these fly tires out there, are like, how do we make a Ned fly? How do we make a Ned fly? The main question that you should ask yourself is how do we fish the flies that we have the most confidence in on the bottom the same way you do with a spinning rod? The reason why tube jigs and Ned rigs are so deadly is because of the speed of the presentation. The mono or the monofilament or the fluorocarbon on a spinning rod is typically six, four to eight pounds. So four, six or eight pounds. It is a very thin diameter and you've got a heavy jig head, which means that's going to hit the bottom and there's not going to be a lot of tension on that line, pulling it out of that hole. If you're throwing a crayfish with a, a full sinking line, an intermediate line, or any of those subsurface lines, now you have the diameter of that heavy line under the surface being pulled out of that zone that you're fishing and have you ever tried to mend a sinking line it's impossible so i started thinking to myself and it started in the winter time how do i slow my presentations down and my first thought was a floating line with about a 16 foot thin leader so the first time i did it i took eight 
I took 16 pounds of eight pound, 16 feet of eight pound tippet, put it on my fly line, threw it out there, hit myself in the back of the head. It was the most miserable day of my life. And then I realized, oh, you have to taper a little bit. So I started tapering, making taper leaders fully out of fluorocarbon. But normally when you have an eight pound tippet leader, the butt section is about 40 pounds or even 50 pounds. It totally depends on, on who the manufacturer is. But there's a pretty significant difference between the top of that tapered leader and the bottom of that leader. So you still have a decent amount of tension in there or serves there for that water to grab. So I started building leaders that were 14 to 16 feet, 20 pound, 16, 12, 10 to eight. So very thin leaders. No, it is not easy to cast. Do not try to be left of your Bob Clouser making that super tight loop of that thing because you're going to do nothing but get stuck. Open that cast up, lob it out there, chuck and duck, get it in the water because now you have that 14 foot leader, that 16 foot leader, and you've got that fly. That fly line, that floating fly line is not going to get pulled under because you have so much distance between your fly and your fly line. So now you don't have a short leader, you know, pulling that line under and mending even a floating line, mending a floating line that subsurface is pretty hard. But if you have that longer leader, you can now upstream, downstream mend, you can stack mend, you can slow that presentation down a lot. And you can stay in that zone that you're trying to fish for probably three to four times longer than if you were fishing an actual sinking line. So that's something that I started doing a lot more the last couple of years. It has been extremely productive. The other thing, the other part of that equation is a lighter fly. And again, this comes directly from the gear fishing world. And people ask me all the time, like, you know, I shouldn't say people ask me all the time, but there is a, a negative stigmatization to spin fishing. Most of us started fishing with a Zebco push button and worms. So we all have held a spinning rod or a, a some sort of conventional rod at one point in our life. So going back to that, looking at those, what those guys do, I have learned so much on fly presentation from guys that spin fishing that do it well. And that is where I've realized that fishing a heavy crayfish, yes, it might get down, but all that crayfish is doing is trying to get down in the deepest hole it possibly can and stay there. So you're not doing a lot of fishing. You get more of this jackhammer up and down motion in a crayfish when it's super heavy watching some of these guys fish weightless worms or ned rigs that are super lightly weighted and watching that ned or that tube or that worm fall to the bottom and then when they lift it or twitch it it comes back up and it flutters back down that fall gets so many so many fish's attention it is insane so when you have a heavy weighted fly like a crayfish with a large or a medium lead eye and it goes Soof! the best like what was that you know but if you have a crayfish that yes it might take longer to get down going like this it's like i'm in right and then whenever you if you're doing the floating line and the, the thin leader every time you mend it that crayfish goes like this and when it hits the water it just kind of tumbles around it doesn't try to stick super deep into the water so it's constantly moving i went from losing six crayfish a day to six crayfish in a season it was that drastic and we probably caught more fish because now we're actually fishing that crayfish it might take longer to get to the bottom but when you have the ability to keep it there, it doesn't matter how long it takes to get there because you can keep it there longer. See how excited I get about this? This is like, this is what just changed my life. Um, so weighted streamers on floating line. Again, I mentioned reducing drag, all that stuff, but just to show you, um, this is a really cool picture um, of kind of the, under the hood of some of my crayfish. So this one has foam on it. Blank chocolate puts foam on the claws itself. A lot of my crayfish, I use um, uh, squirrel zonkers instead of rabbit because our native crayfish typically have smaller claws. The rusty crayfish, you can tell the difference between a rusty crayfish and native crayfish because typically a rusty crayfish's claws are about half the size of its actual body. Our native crayfish are about a third to a quarter of the body. So they're much easier to eat. So would you rather try to eat a fly that looks like the thing that's going to bite you really hard or would you rather eat a fly that's going to be a little bit easier for you to digest and get down quickly so most of my flies i tie with smaller claws on there just because it looks a little bit easier to eat and i typically fish much smaller crayfish than most people do so instead of putting the foam on the actual claws or on the hide of that that squirrel because it just comes off because there's not that much service area or purchase on there for you to glue it what i do is i make two wraps of the uh of the uh, the foam right at the bend of the hook i don't want it to sit like this but what i want it to do is when that when that 
smaller lead eye or that meat or that uh, little tungsten bead hits the bottom, I want it to kind of get lifted a little bit and that current pick it up and just fall back over. So I'm not trying to get that vertical presentation. I'm trying to keep that hook off the bottom as much as possible. I do put rattles in them sometimes, love to articulate them. Um, articulation is huge. And then the top of those, those that crayfish uh, is something that I've never seen done before. Maybe it has been, but instead of just putting the rabbit strip over the top still on the hide, I cut it off of the hide, reverse tie it and flare it out. So then you get a much broader uh, carapace or shell on that thing. And it ke keeps that profile a little bit better. It doesn't get super, super small. Um, and they work sometimes. So floating lines, same thing, 10 foot. We already talked about that. I'll now show you my actual leader formula. So this is one that if you wanna take a picture, I would highly recommend it. Um, so 40 inches of 20 pounds, 30 of 16, 20 of 12, 16 of 10, 12 of eight, and then 18 to 24 of six to eight pound tippet. So it is a very, very thin leader, um, works super, super well, gets down, doesn't have a lot of drag, catches you more fish. Dry fly fishing, I mentioned before, don't pop the popper most of the time. There are definitely times where you do want to pop a popper or the deer hair frog, for instance, yesterday, well, actually yesterday was about 50-50 where we were like, bloop, you know, creating that long trail of bubbles. And then there was a lot of just, you know, mending it and watching it slide forward or mending it downstream, watching it slide forward. So watching what those fish are doing is very important in the reaction of what you're doing. And then that can give you that presentation. So again, I mentioned before, I removed the, the ability to pop so that you can't pop. Um, dead drifting versus popper. Um, when it comes to dead drifting, this is something I've actually talked to a couple of different guides in Virginia about. Um, if you look at a boogle bug, for instance, if you look at the taper of an actual popper and you look at the taper of a cicada, they are very, very similar. Now, if you have a popper with a lot of stuff hanging off the back of it, that's mostly to imitate a frog. But a cicada's body is almost identical to what a popper's taper is. So fishing a very non-moving dead drifted popper is actually matching the hatch of some of the food that's in there. And that kind of lift or that pull versus pop creates that wiggle and that wake of that, of that bug going bleh, bleh. I don't know if you've ever seen a cicada on the water. It's kind of funny. They create all kinds of ripples. But um, so, you know, that is, it's very important to pay attention to that stuff. Foam, stimulators, extended bodies, all of that. The other day we were out on the Junietta. It's April. You're supposed to be fishing six, to, six inch streamers. Every single bass in that river was rising to March browns and sulfurs. And I had one brown stone fly dry fly. Zero poppers, nothing. I was very upset about that because my client lost it on the second fish. And so I was like, well, that would have been pretty epic. So now I will never not have at least one yellow popper in my box. Um, but matching the hatch is very important. So dry fly fishing doesn't necessarily mean poppers. It means matching exactly what's happening on the surface. So um, another thing that's super interesting uh, that I kind of skipped over, and I've been asked this question a lot, does size and color matter when it comes to poppers? Absolutely. One of the things that I find extremely interesting is that when you hit that summertime, when you start to get in that summertime season where those bass have a lot of different food to eat and they're starting to inspect your bigger poppers a lot of times, that is because, mentioning probably six or seven times already, that cicadas and some of those bigger bugs don't get off the water very easily or at all. So those bass know that that size and color they can stare at for an hour if they really want to, because it's not going anywhere. But damselflies and dragonflies never actually touch the surface. Their body weight is too much for their feet to hold up. They will float on grass and other things, but they never actually touch the surface. So a smallmouth has to commit to eating that thing well before it gets close to the water. So when you have those picky fish, and you start to get a lot of stares and a lot of follows, downsides is something that looks more like it could still be a popper, but it could be a smaller blue or smaller olive popper or a foam bug that's a little bit longer in blue. And I bet you, you'll see a significant difference in that reaction to that fly because those fish know that that color and size means that they have to eat it without actually it hitting the water. And that's why if you've ever seen it, you know, in the summertime, bass jumping out of the water, they are literally trying to eat damselflies and dragonflies as they're flying across the surface. One of the coolest things that you'll see is when sometimes you get those grass mats with like 50 to 100 damsels. And if you've ever seen it, it's super cool. Sometimes you'll get a very aggressive bass to come up and just explode through the grass and try to grab as many as it possibly can and it breaks up the grass. 
Um, I've only seen that twice and it scared me both times because I'm like staring at this beautiful thing of draft and it's just like an explosion. So, um, but dry fly set up six day weight rods. Again, spring dry flies, mainly poppers and or frogs and mice. We're going to go eight weights or seven weights. And then when you hit that summertime, we're throwing smaller flies. You want a lighter presentation. So having a softer, a little bit lighter rod is going to give you that softer presentation. Um, eight to 14 foot leaders. Most of the time when I tell people I fish 14 foot leaders for bass, they kind of look at me like I got three heads. But when those fish are super spooky and the only thing between you or that fly and your fly line that's typically not any other color besides a bright color, when it's this close to the fly, those fish can see that because there's something, they're not actually looking at the motion, they're looking at the fly. So they're looking up and there's this bright thing and then there's a bug. They're like, hmm, I don't know about that. So the further you can be between your fly line and your dry fly in the summertime is very important. That is when I typically go to that 14 foot leader. If you've ever tried to cast a deer head frog on 14 foot leader, I don't, just don't do it. Stick with a six foot or an eight foot leader because you need that ability to turn that fly over. You need a smaller, a smaller leader to turn that over. So everybody makes a prepackaged leader for that. A lot of bass, there's a lot of bass line, uh, leaders out there. Typically those bass leaders have about uh, paracord for the butt section and then tapers down and it's a very short aggressive taper. Um, so those are great for the bigger stuff, but if I am going to throw uh, more of that dry fly hopper stuff, I'll just go buy a nine foot or a 12 foot trout leader because it's going to give you that supple presentation. But I also build my own. This one I do build out of mono and the only thing that is fluorocarbon is the tippet itself. I have built, well, I should say I have built, I have taken a crayfish off of a floral leader in a pinch and throw a dry fly on there and it will pull that thing under after about five or six casts because it does have a pretty significant amount of weight on there so monofilament 40 inches of 30 pound 25 20 16 12 um occasionally if i'm going a little bit smaller i will do a very small piece of like 10 or 8 and then go to the tippet itself but that will give you kind of that 12 10 and a half to 11 foot leader and then you can extend either the butt section or tippet to get yourself a couple extra feet on there I would recommend if you have that, if you get in those situations where those fish are still being picky on that 10 or 11 foot leader, extend it on the butt section. It's gonna give you the ability to turn a little bit more over. Um, if you just add tippet, what you're gonna end up seeing is that leader kind of stop and that fly just kind of fall because you've got all that velocity and that momentum coming down and then you go from a perfect tapered leader to really thin and just, just falls down. So extend that butt section versus the tippet if you wanna get a little bit longer on that. I love this picture, one, because it's a giant smallmouth, but two, because, sorry, people on Zoom, you can't see me do this, but I want you all to look at how low and clear that water is right there behind that fish. This picture is great because that fish was sitting right there. That, there was a very small indent. The water itself was only about six inches deep along this entire bank, and there was one or two spots, well, there's probably much more than that, but this fish was in just a small indent. It was about eight to 10 inches where that fish was sitting. And while I was just arguing, this used to be my Sims rep, which was awesome when he caught that fish because I got free waders after that. But um, we were just arguing about there not being any fish in that, that super skinny water. But what's really cool is that grass behind there is called lizard tail. Um, if you see it in the summertime when it gets its flower, it actually looks like a little white lizard tail. That is an all you can eat buffet or an all inclusive resort for bugs. Anything that makes it into the water starts in that grass. And these fish know that. So they're going to run up into that, that super skinny edge right there. And they're going to sit there because that those bigger fish, they don't want to move very far. People call smallmouth lazy. They are extremely efficient and super smart. And for everybody who loves trout, I'm sorry what I'm about to say. Smallmouth live three to four times longer than a trout. So in theory, a big smallmouth is three to four times smarter than a big trout the theory um but i'd like to show that picture because bass will sit in extremely skinny water they all they need to do is cover their dorsal fin and they will sit there if they know that food is going to be there so never overlook super skinny water especially in the summertime and then nymphs nymphing euro style again kind of this is one of those spinoffs of trout fishing it's a newer thing that people are talking about um you know going with the nymph style stuff for their food but Euro style nymphing for smallmouth is actually extremely effective. 
Um, it is the closest thing that we can do as fly anglers to as spin guys can do with a tube jig. You have very little line on the water, if not any thin leader. You're very connected to that thing. Um, I have found that especially in the springtime when the water's colder, what we'll have a lot of times is you'll have these couple warm days and those bass will move in from that skinny or that, sorry, that deeper slow water into the fast transition water. And then the temps will drop and they'll stay there for a couple of days because yes, it might be moving too fast, but they don't want to expend the energy to get out of that. So they'll stay there. So in the, in the springtime, it's actually a great way to do it, whether you're wade fishing or out of a drift boat is Euro style nymphing for these, these bass in these riffles, which is really awesome. When I'm Euro nymphing with a crayfish, I got one crayfish on because typically it's heavy enough. But if I am going to fish like a stone fly or a helgramite or something like that, I will put two different flies on there. It's not something that I do on a regular basis, but it is a good option or a good thing to kind of practice every once in a while. Because if you do get in those situations where they're not eating anything super aggressively, top or bottom, you know, that slow presentation is really important. I like to show this picture because, again, going with that smart and efficient side, if you were to swing a crayfish or a helgramite nymph or even a minnow across that, sure, you're going to catch a lot of those more um, motivated smaller fish. But those bigger fish that are in those, those kind of indents that are two or three feet deep in those ripples, they're not necessarily going to come up and eat that because they know they sit there long enough something's going to fall into their lap and they can eat it. So it gives you the ability to get those flies a little bit deeper into some of this pocket water and sometimes get fish that you don't, you wouldn't otherwise get. So it's just an option. It's not something that I would say, quit doing what you're doing now and go your own for bass. But if you want to try something different, you can do that. I typically use a 10 foot five weight or a 10 foot six weight rod. I just grab one of my steelhead rods and I go out, put a leader on it. It's the same exact leader that I use for trout as I do for smallmouth, except instead of six or seven X tippet, I use six or eight pound fluorocarbon. So that is the same leader formula for my trout Euro leader. It's very basic. It doesn't have any major tapers to it, um, but that's the same thing I'm gonna use. Same with the picture up there of those actual leaders that you could buy. That's basically the same exact leader that I built. So you don't have to build a crazy leader for this. You can just go buy one if you want, but it's just another option for that. Um, and that's a fish with a fly sticking out of its mouth again. And now I'll ask if you have any questions. How'd I do? Questions. Anybody have any questions? Some folks probably never tried that Um so the the biggest thing that i would the the most important part of a two fly rig is the distance between the two of them um if you go too short you're going to spend a lot of time untangling them they're going to kind of flip over top of themselves so distance between those flies typically 18 inches to 24 inches depends on you know the depth of the water you're fishing because if you're only fishing a two to three foot hole that first fly that you have is typically going to be a little bit higher in that column so it's not going to be fishing necessarily um but i don't really pay that much attention to the weight um i will do two mediums one medium one small you know in the lead style um but just like nymphing a lot of times i will have the heavier fly on top and the lighter on the bottom so you do get that kind of pull down and those both those flies are sitting a little bit closer to the bottom um if you keep if you go in the world of the euro style stuff and you put the heavier fly on the bottom even if you're not euro style that bottom fly is going to hit the bottom and that top one is going to stay a little bit inverted or it's going to fall down in front of it and you're going to end up coming up tangled so uh i would keep a heavier one either same exact weight 18 to 24 inches apart or i put a heavier one on the top and a lighter one on the bottom i've never messed with like weighted and unweighted i've always had double weighted but i would say that you know if you were to put a deceiver on the on the on the bottom of a something and you were running it like this or vice versa and you kind of were i have had this happen at least not so much with bass but i've had it on salt water sometimes where like i'll be throwing an actual like a bait fish and you'll have these fish follow it and they won't commit to it so we'll put something smaller on the back like a shrimp behind it like two feet behind it and they'll come up and they'll look at that bait fish and as they fall back they see that shrimp back there and they grab the shrimp because it's a little bit less intrusive so um so yeah the answer to that is typically just two feet between them, 
same weight or slightly lighter on the bottom so that you keep both those flies kind of in that same zone. Yes. We have a question that came through the chat. Um, so what if a fish on lake? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice? Uh, most of your talk is kind of mostly rivers. Yeah. But uh, bigger lakes. I have I have found that aside from and I've I've been asked this question a, a bunch actually. I don't do a lot of lake fishing for smallmouth. I have done some. Um, but typically when I'm lake fishing, I'm just fishing docks and things like that. I'm not spending a lot of time, you know, figuring out depth and looking for rock piles. But if I were to say anything, I would say that the techniques are exactly the same. Um, and in lakes, that's the only time that I would probably use a heavier sinking line to get down a little bit. But I was talking to a guy that fishes Lake Erie uh, at the Lancaster show. Um, and I was talking about the floating line thing and he goes, I always have an issue with the sinking lines that I use, not being able to feel fish or getting stuck or whatever. And he's like, I'm going to try using the floating line and just a heavier fly. And he called, well, he didn't call me, he emailed me actually two weeks ago. He's like, I switched to that. I started using large and extra large lead eyes and almost jig styling with the fly line. And he's like, I don't lose as many flies and I catch more fish. So that's my story. So I don't have I don't have a lot of good information about lake fishing other than fishing structure on the bank and paying attention to the actual, you know, um, the water temperatures and the different thermals of that stuff and seeing when those fish start to move up. Um, but other than that, I got I don't have a lot. So. Yeah. Yes. You mean like an indicator or like a drift like a. Oh no, not I have I have not done that, but um, I do have a couple of buddies that that have messed around with that style. I mean, I don't think they've done any better than we have, but um, you know, occasionally that thing. I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't work at all. So I just haven't done it. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, they'll go up in just about anything. I mean, we found fish in creeks that are probably two table widths before. So um, smallmouth are just like steel in the sense that they they migrate via scent because that's like where they were where they were rendered and, and raised was in the creek that they go back into spawn. The only time they don't do that is when the water can sometimes be too low. Um, and then you will have fish that will like hold up and wait for like a good flow to come down and then the water will get too warm before that happens and they'll end up spawning like right around that creek. Um, but yeah, we found them in super, super small stuff before. There's a creek right outside of Philly called Valley Creek. It's full of wild brown trout. Um, and we have found smallmouth in the spring, like a mile up that. Before. Well, not really, I guess it can't really go a mile because there's a dam, but pretty much that lower three quarters to a mile we've seen bass spawning in that and it's that wide you know so it might be a little wider than that but it's pretty small so yeah I, they'll go wherever they wherever they want yes Sure. I, I mean, when I, the, the big thing that I do typically is just go to like the largest trout fly that I would fish, like a stone fly, or I have fished like a, like a size 10 or even an eight, like pheasant tail sometimes. Um, but I typically, the way I start that method is like, okay, I know that right now there's probably a lot of damsel fly nymphs or stone fly nymphs crawling around. So I'm going to put a girdle bug and you know, a damsel fly nymph, or I'm just going to run, you know, a pheasant tail, a big pheasant tail and a girdle bug. Start with that. And then as you progress into the season and the helger might start to move around and the, the crayfish start to move around, I tie a lot of crayfish that are like an inch to an inch and a half. And they're awesome for, for nymphing with because they have movement. And, you know, every time you mend, it, you move that indicator a little bit, that fly is going to do a little bit something. So I kind of just progress just like you would a, a, you know, through this, the, 
hatches of mayflies like progress into that and then kind of at by the point by the point that you're at damselfly nymphs, crayfish and elgramites they're probably eating a lot of other stuff too so um five weights six weights um typically when i'm going to nymph i'm going to use a 10 foot five or 10 foot six because and i have indicator fish as well a few times but i i'd like to use the kind of I want to say like the old school method, but the pre-indicator way of nymphing and just using that that line itself as your indicator and being able to mend it and watch that, um, and that works that works really well. So, um, but I, but to the float fishing in that side, I've got one of my buddies that they guide for Spruce Creek or Home Waters out in, in State College, and they kind of moved into the bass side. They started testing some of their clients, and they're like, "Oh, this is actually fun." and they always bring spinning rods because they get on the water and they're like, yeah, we're not catching bass because they're used to fishing small creeks and they can't cast that far and they'll use spinning rods a lot. But what they started to do was actually nymph fishing crayfish with bobbers and like insane amount of success with that. So, so and they don't have to be far either, which is pretty cool. So you can just kind of throw it out there, but it does, that does work too. So um, we tried it, we tried it a couple of years ago uh, we actually had a Ned in the boat from the previous trip and we put it four feet underneath of a popper and popper dropper with a Ned ring. We only caught one fish, but it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't personally, I don't personally like soft tackles for some reason. I just, I mean, I like swinging flies for steelhead and, and I do swing for trout, but yeah, absolutely. There's a guy, there's a couple guys um, that have, uh, I forget what the one guy's name is. He's out, of, he's like just over the border in Erie and he does a lot of the, the Erie trip smallmouth stuff. And he basically has a soft tackle that's on like a size eight salmon fly hook or something. I mean, it's pretty big. Um, and he swings that when those fish come in and it's just, it's just like, I think cause the water's low and clear a lot of times in those creeks when they come in, it's, it's not very intrusive. So it's like a natural, it's got movement. Um, and he does super well with that stuff. And I, I have a fly that I use under the, in, my hoppers a lot of times it's weightless. It's basically a weightless woolly bugger, but instead of marabou, it's just got rubber legs on the bottom. So it's, but it's like more of a slap and soft tackle up the shank. And it just moves a lot and they just, they get into that. So, yeah, I mean, bats are opportunistic predators. They will literally eat anything that they can fit in their mouth or they think they can fit in their mouth. So um, the craziest thing that I've ever seen in a small mouth mouth was a baby snapping turtle. So um, they, they will literally eat just about anything. So yeah, soft tags are definitely a good way to do it for sure. So, I mean, and like I said, no, I, no, but. Uh, a but a buddy of mine, a buddy of mine, I I set we, so we were fishing last spring and and it was I'm pretty sure this fish was what in what I call the clean out stage of the spawning period and that's when they're up on the edges they haven't built their beds yet but they're kind of like testing the water and they eat everything that comes in the, in their area and so I think this fish was in the clean out stage and this little snapping turtle just you know kind of walked in the wrong spot. But I always in the spring look in their mouth to see like if there's anything in there. Cause a lot of times you'll see like the antennas of the crayfish or you'll see like a, a tail sticking out of their throat or something like that. And I looked in there and I was like, what is that? And I looked a little closer and I was like, that's a snapping turtle. And it was about this big. Um, and I was told a buddy of mine and he's like, yeah, my father-in-law, he lives in Texas and they fish rubber turtles for largemouth all the time down there. And I'm like, that is ridiculous. But Apparently they eat turtles too. So, I mean, you think about it, a baby snapping turtle or a baby turtle has a soft shell and crayfish are also, you know, have a hard shell. So if they'll eat those, as long as they get it down their throat, they'll eat it. So, um, but yeah. Anybody else? Yes. So um, when folks come on the group boat, folks that aren't familiar with small mouth, one of the things that I find they struggle with the trout, especially with smallmouth when you grab and fit a fly. You want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great a great question, comment, or thing to talk about. So um most predatory fish 
will either eat a minnow or a bait fish from the front or the side. Um, Smallmouth are one of, of one of very few predators that actually eat a lot of their, their food from behind them. Um, and that's because of that kind of explosive speed. They don't have, they're not like a striper or a muskie or a trout that's long and narrow and very, you know, can swim a long ways and, and like kind of get around it and eat it before it. So they come up and they just, they come up behind it and they open their gills and they suck it in. But as they suck that in, they're still moving forward. Um, and a lot of times what bass will actually do is they will eat slack into your line itself. So unless you can see that fly, that fly disappear, there are so many times that you're getting eaten and that fly is actually moving closer to you. So you feel nothing. So it's very important that, and this is something I say with crayfish, especially, but also anytime you can't see the fly, if it feels like you just got ticked by a rock, set the hook because they're not going to eat, always eat super aggressively. They're not going to swim through it. They do, but they're not always going to swim through it. And all of a sudden you feel that fish on. It's more of like, I felt kind of like I just hit a log or a rock I'll set anyway. And then like there, sometimes it is a rock, sometimes not, but I say set the hook on everything because there's so many times that it's just like as a guide and spending 160 days a year watching fly lines move, you get very in tune with what those fly lines do when a fish eats it. And there are so many times that I'm staring this line going like this and the client's just like, I'm like, you're going to set? Well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, your fly line doesn't have life in it. So when it moves, there's something on the other end. So, you know, but that's like, that's, that's a very, uh, I would say that's more of like the extreme, right? But like, so watching it wiggle is a very tall, easy sign to see. But there's so many times where like, you could be fishing a streamer that you're only a foot under the surface and you strip it. And when you, when you strip it, strip it and you're pausing to grab it again, and you're watching that fly line and you see that fly line with no movement that you're making slide this way or slide that way or get pulled backwards, you might not feel it because you're in the middle of a strip and you've got slack, but you can see the tip of that line do something, get on that thing and pull as hard as you can because there's a fish on the end of it. So the, the answer to that question is that always watch the tip of your fly line. So that's one reason why the clear, the clear intermediates can be a little bit tough in that sense because you can't see them that well um, but you can see there's always a junction between the clear and the running line that is colored so if I'm fishing in an intermediate clear tip I'm going to actually look at the junction of color in that line um, and then but if you're fishing an intermediate that's not clear you can still see it most of the time and you can just watch that line do stuff so watch the line set the hook on everything best advice I can give you yeah I I put it in the back personally because if you're if you're fishing an articulated fly and you put you have a shank in the front and a hook in the back most of the time you also have a tail of some sort hanging off the back so that hook actually ends up in the middle of that fly versus the front and I I hate fishing game changers with one front hook because I there are so many times I watch those fish go like this and you can see the head of that changer and you pull and it just comes straight out of the bass's mouth they never get the hook so I would always put it in the back because it ends up in the middle of the fly itself and that's going to give you your most hooks at. it's the same with musky design with musky flies a lot of guys that only fish one hook put it in the middle of the fly because they t-bone it or if they come over the back of it they're still going to get that hook, but they got to put that whole fly in their mouth to get that front hook. So I go back hook most of the time. Um, but if I can have two hooks, I will. And there's been lots of times where I've thought about putting a treble hook off the back of it so that the client will actually catch the fish because there's already two hooks and it still doesn't work. So I'm like, let's add three more and see what happens. But um, no, I, I would do, I would do back hook personally. So, and that the back hook, on a fly design side as well, the back hook is actually going to give you more weight in the back. So if you're tying like a minnow pattern that's got a bulky head, when that when that when that fly comes through the water and you stop, it's basically hitting a wall of water, right? 
And so that bit, that head's going to go this way or this way or this way or this way. It's going to go one of four directions. It's not going to just stop and sit there. When it stops and goes this way, a lot of times that, that hook is heavier. So that hook's actually going to go the other direction. So you're going to end up with that weight in the back of the fly is actually going to keep that fly moving at a more of a natural action than, than I'm putting it in the front because you don't have as much weight. So, yeah, you got it. So this thing changed again. Hang on, you got more to do. I do? You didn't buy a raffle ticket, did you? No. Yeah, you did. Well, that means you're impartial. Okay. <laughs> So the ride raffle is probably the, the primary fundraiser that Twin Tiers Club does so that we can bring speakers like Jake in to talk to, to, to the members of both clubs. I want to thank everybody that, that bought a ticket for, for this year's raffle. And, uh, and this year we're, we're not only giving away any TFO ride, but also including the two-handed spay rides as well. So you get to choose one of those if you win. So good luck, everybody. And uh, you've been shaken up a million times already, but Jake, if you would pull the winner for us. Uh-oh. Oh my gosh. Put it back in there. Put it back in they, 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 People aren't going to believe it. Kurt. <laughs> yeah, no, no fooling. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. You got him. You got him. But, 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 you know, but, but in all honesty. In the middle and put it out, too. So, so so he buys a lot of tickets. I, I, I put the tickets in here and I know he buys a lot, so he deserves it. <laughs> so I wanna thank everybody uh, for, for coming out. I wanna thank everybody online. There was about 14 folks online that joined us that way. Um, Jake, I know you're gonna hang around for a little while. You got some books. Have some books. Uh, how much? 40 bucks. 40 bucks? Sign, 40 bucks. I'm just kidding. Yeah, it actually goes down. Um, so, yeah, I have, I, I think I have uh, eight or nine books here. Um, so, if you're not familiar with that book, a lot of what I talked about in here is in there. So, it is a, it does say something about flies top to bottom, but it is much more than just that. It is um, an encyclopedia. So, there are 346 fly patterns with just recipes. It's broken down top, middle, and bottom. Um, and then there are 16 step-by-step -step tutorials, four in each, or I think there's five, five, and four, or so I don't know how it works. But anyway, there's 16 different tutorials um, of all my favorite bass flies. They're not all mine. Um, the 346 patterns came from around the country and around the world, actually. So there's lots of trout flies in there that also double over as bass flies. And then, on top of that, in each one of those flies, I talk about when, why, where, and how to fish them. And there's about 40,000 words in total on just bass in general. So it's every, it's everything. Cool. Small mouth specific, yeah. Cool. So um, also I want to amplify a point that, that uh, Don made. And I want to rethank uh, TC for all the heavy lifting on getting things set up. Really cool venue, really cool speaker. Thanks, TC. Yeah. All right, we're gonna end the live uh, live stream, but you're welcome to stay around, hang around, talk, uh, and thanks to the folks we have online.